They're always going to be treated. The dingo to do what the dingo does. Australia's wild dog. Imagine waking up to find your livestock killed by wild dogs. It's just one of the most disheartening things that you have to deal with. A harsh reality for many Australian farmers dealing with dingoes. There's a couple of juveniles coming into the carcass dump. These native dogs are known for preying on sheep, cattle, and goats. <laughs> farmers have employed methods like fencing, hunting, and using guardian animals to protect their livestock to undertake a huge fencing infrastructure project with a view to excluding wild dogs. But how effective, humane, and sustainable are these strategies? Can we find a balance that protects livestock without harming wildlife? So about three years ago, I made a decision to change my strategy about controlling wild dogs in my property and decided to go and look. Today, we delve into how Australian farmers deal with millions of dingo dogs attacking livestock. There you go, beautiful. Pin him down. The dingo, Australia's wild dog, is like a furry time traveler, arriving on our shores about 4,000 years ago with seafarers from Asia. It's a distant relative of the gray wolf and has become a versatile Aussie, making homes in deserts and forests. I'm right up close and it's all happening just natural like I would in the bush except for... Being a top predator and scavenger, the dingo is like the boss of the animal party keeping the numbers of kangaroos, rabbits, and foxes in check. However, trouble started when the British sailed in with their own animal crew in 1788. The dingoes, perhaps feeling a bit territorial, saw sheep as an all-you-can-eat buffet. This sparked a feud between dingoes and farmers that still echoes today. Australian farmers have a responsibility to control dingoes, or wild dogs. In a bid to protect their woolly friends, the farmers got creative. They shot, trapped, and even poisoned dingoes. To top it off, they built a colossal wall, the dingo fence, stretching over 5,600 kilometers, 3,479 miles, making it the longest fence worldwide. But we'll dive more into this later. Wild dogs, or dingoes, were killed through trapping and hunting programs. The dingoes faced tough times. They got mixed up with domestic dogs, People worried that they were becoming more like Fido than the wild dogs they once were. But recent studies threw a curveball. Dingoes in the wild seem to have stayed mostly pure, giving hope to those who believe in their unique Aussie identity. Now you all have some very good traits. All dingoes have their part in the pack. <laughs> now you might be scratching your heads over a big question. Are dingoes friends or foes? Some argue they're like the guardians of the land, the bosses of the country, keeping the balance in nature. Others see them as troublemakers, especially when they eye up livestock. It's a complicated debate, not just about dingoes, but also about money, feelings, and what's right. There's no easy answer to whether the dingo is a good dog or a rogue wolf. In the end, this wild dog is a living piece of Aussie history, a bit of a mystery that deserves attention and understanding. But from what we know, they can have their rough sides. The dingoes of Australia have stirred up a storm on farms, making their mark on the country's history for more than 200 years. Farmers and their livestock have been caught in a tug of war with these wild dogs, particularly when it comes to sheep, cattle, and goats. The toll is more than economic, it's emotional too. Studies vary on the extent of the damage, with some claiming dingoes can wipe out up to 40% of sheep in certain areas. However, others argue that dingoes are not all bad news. They might even be beneficial by curbing the numbers of troublesome creatures like rabbits, foxes, and cats. The battle between dingoes and farmers led to some serious problem solving. The Dingo Fence, a whopping 5,614 kilometers or 3,479 miles barricade stretching across three states, was raised in the late 1800s and early 1900s to shield the sheep industry from dingo attacks. This mega fence still stands and is closely watched today. However, not everyone agrees on its effectiveness or ethics. Some say it's expensive, cruel, unsustainable, and even bad for the environment. Critics suggest alternatives like guardian animals, electric fences, better livestock care, and non-lethal deterrence. 
Some even advocate for a world where dingoes and livestock coexist peacefully. Beyond the farm fields, dingoes have found themselves tangled in a different kind of drama, one involving humans, especially children. The infamous case of Lindy Chamberlain Crichton in 1980 captured the world's attention. Lindy was wrongly convicted of murdering her baby Azaria after claiming a dingo snatched her from a tent at Uluru. It took more than three decades to clear Lindy's name, highlighting the misunderstandings and challenges surrounding dingo incidents. I'm trying to go and tell people I just yelled out, has anyone got a torch? The dingo's got my baby. On Kigari, Fraser Island, a paradise and tourist magnet, dingoes have had tense encounters with humans. Over 100 recorded incidents since 1990 tell a story of dingoes biting or attempting to bite people, with tragic cases like the death of nine-year-old Clinton Gage in 2001. The management of dingoes on Kigari is like walking a tightrope, conservation versus safety, tourism versus indigenous interests. The Queensland government's dingo management strategy aims to find that balance using education, rules, monitoring, and intervention to safeguard visitors and preserve the island's natural and cultural treasures. But how do farmers guard themselves against these animals? I've got to believe there's a way to control them without wiping them out. Fencing, like the dingo fence that spans continents, has been a go-to strategy for farmers aiming to shield their livestock from the wild, toothy threat. There are two main players in the fencing game, the barrier fences and the cluster fences. Imagine barrier fences as the heavyweights in the ring. These are colossal structures like the dingo fence, the longest fence globally, snaking across regions and states. Their job is to play bouncer, keeping dingoes out of areas with livestock and creating a sort of no dingo zone. Built with wire mesh, steel posts, gates, and sometimes even a zing of electricity, these fences cover vast expanses, protect multiple properties, and can make other control methods less necessary. Yet they're pricey to build and maintain, and can be breached by determined dingoes or other critters. The new section of the dog fence will cost $25 million and take five years to build. Their impact on the ecosystem and wildlife isn't all positive. They can mess with the balance of species, disrupt natural movements, and even increase the risk of animals getting tangled or injured. The introduction of an electric shock element adds an extra layer of deterrence to barrier fences. This electrified feature acts as a powerful deterrent for cunning dingoes attempting to breach the fence, enhancing the overall effectiveness of the barrier. And then there are cluster fences, the more localized, strategic players. These fences wrap around a group of neighboring properties, forming a cluster. The idea here is to create a safe haven for livestock within the cluster, letting dingoes live their wild lives outside. Built with high tensile wire, steel posts, gates, and a bit of a shocking touch, cluster fences are more budget-friendly and easier to handle than their larger counterparts. They can be customized to fit local conditions and the needs of farmers. To undertake a huge fencing infrastructure project with a view to excluding wild dogs. And they even come with some ecological perks. They can help control feral herbivores and predators, boost biodiversity and productivity of the land, and let dingoes do their natural thing. However, they can still be breached by determined dingoes or other animals. They might also stir up conflicts among the farmers within or outside the cluster, and they sometimes bring unintended consequences, such as increasing the pressure on livestock outside the cluster, or affecting the behavior and genetics of the dingoes within. Pretty much because of their well-known impacts on livestock. Additionally, the behavior and genetics of dingoes within the cluster may experience unintended alterations, adding complexity to the delicate dance between human activity and the natural world. Balancing these challenges remains a puzzle in the ongoing effort to coexist with the wild dogs of Australia. While both fencing styles can be a frontline defense against dingo attacks, they're not without their trade-offs and challenges. Fencing is like a chess move in the larger game of protecting livestock. It's a piece, not the entire board. To tackle the dingo dilemma effectively, it takes more than just fences. Think of it like cooking. You don't just rely on one ingredient, you mix and match. Fencing in this holistic approach is like the salt, an essential part of the recipe, but not the entire dish. 
Guardian animals, deterrence, land management, and livestock husbandry are the other ingredients in this complex recipe. It's about finding the right balance, keeping the wild dogs at bay while ensuring the welfare of the livestock, and preserving the unique dance of Australia's ecosystem. So, are there other severe control methods? Not only has the fencing project given hope for the wool industry in central Queensland. As farmers grapple with the wild presence of dingoes in Australia, lethal control methods like hunting, trapping and poisoning have entered the fray, aiming to quell the impact of these wild dogs on both livestock and wildlife. The rationale driving these approaches is rooted in the belief that by reducing or eliminating the dingo population, the predation pressure on livestock will ease, leading to economic and ecological benefits. However, the effectiveness and ethical implications of these lethal strategies are now under the microscope, with scientists, conservationists, and animal welfare advocates challenging their reliance on what they see as flawed assumptions, outdated data, and biased perspectives. Small lambs, dead, all from one dog, just went through and just banged, just bit, bit like that. A foundational assumption in the use of lethal control methods is the classification of dingoes as non-native introduced pests that have disrupted the natural balance of the Australian ecosystem. Historical evidence points to their arrival around 4,000 years ago, brought by Asian seafarers. However, recent studies present an alternative viewpoint, suggesting that dingoes may have a much longer history, co-evolving with the Australian fauna and flora for up to 18,000 years. Genetic and environmental studies contribute to this alternative narrative by revealing the distinctiveness of wild dingoes compared to domestic and feral dogs debunking the commonly used term wild dog. A second assumption is the notion that dingoes universally exert a negative impact on livestock and wildlife, justifying lethal control as a means to reduce or prevent losses and damages. While anecdotal evidence supports this claim, experimental and modeling studies introduce a layer of nuance. Dingoes, it appears, play a pivotal and positive role in the ecosystem by regulating feral herbivores and predators, enhancing biodiversity, and maintaining the natural functioning of their own population. This complicates the narrative that the elimination of dingoes will unequivocally lead to a reduction in losses and damages. Or is it real dingoes coming out of the bush, or is it a hybrid? Real dingoes, there's, there's, there's both. The third assumption presupposes that lethal control methods are both humane and efficient, guided by established legal and ethical frameworks. However, ethical and welfare studies paint a different picture, indicating that these methods inflict suffering and distress upon dingoes and other animals. The toll encompasses injuries, diseases, starvation, dehydration, stress, fear, anxiety, grief, and social disruption. A flock of sheep around and maim them, they automatically fall into the category of wild dog and need to be destroyed. In light of these challenges and complexities, the aggressive approaches to dingo control, such as hunting, trapping, and poisoning, appear less straightforwardly effective and ethical than often claimed. The foundation supporting these methods is called into question, and their consequences extend beyond their intended targets, affecting the delicate balance of the ecosystem. Alternative methods, including the use of guardian animals, electric fencing, and non-lethal deterrence, emerge as potentially more ethical and effective solutions. This nuanced perspective calls for a paradigm shift, urging a comprehensive approach that strikes a delicate balance between conserving dingoes and ensuring the welfare of livestock. It acknowledges the intricate web of relationships within the Australian ecosystem and underscores the need for a thoughtful and adaptive strategy that respects both the wild and the domesticated elements of this complex environment. And speaking of guard animals, how can they be used? Um, the potential that dingoes have as the, the top order. In the ongoing quest for effective and ethical dingo control, livestock guarding animals have emerged as a promising alternative. These specially trained or bred animals, including dogs, donkeys, llamas, alpacas, and even geese, are tasked with the crucial responsibility of protecting livestock from predators like dingoes. Living alongside their charges, they form bonds with the animals, acting as both companions and defenders, ready to deter, chase, or even fight off potential threats. One standout among these guardians is the Marema Sheepdog, 
a breed with centuries of experience in safeguarding sheep from wolves and bears in its native Italy. A sizable white and fluffy companion, weighing between 77 to 99 pounds or 34 to 45 kilograms, the Maremma Sheepdog boasts a lifespan of about 13 years. Known for its friendliness, loyalty, intelligence, and independence, it adapts seamlessly to various climates and terrains. Remarkably, it extends its protective qualities to children, showcasing a gentle and affectionate nature within its human family. The Maremma Sheepdog's effectiveness lies in its upbringing. Raised alongside livestock from an early age, it forges strong bonds and develops a keen sense of responsibility for its charges. One of them is just protecting our livestock from predators. With versatility in guarding various animals such as sheep, goats, cows, pigs, chickens, and turkeys, the Maremma Sheepdog also exhibits compatibility with other dogs, pets, and barn cats. Not a constant barker, it alerts owners or guardians to potential threats and intruders while marking its territory with scent, acting as a deterrent to predators. If an attack occurs, the Maremma Sheepdog stands firm, utilizing its size, strength, and courage to protect its flock. However, this noble guardian isn't a fit for urban or apartment living, requiring ample space, exercise, and stimulation. A consistent and firm leader is necessary, providing proper training, socialization, and care. The Maremma Sheepdog, not submissive or blindly obedient, relies on its independent nature and decision-making abilities. Respecting its instincts and providing a clear and meaningful role on the farm becomes crucial. Beyond the trusted canine protector, other animals step into the role of guardians, offering their unique set of skills to shield livestock from dingoes and other predators. Donkeys, known for their territorial nature and aggression, become vigilant defenders of sheep and goats. Their instinctive reactions involve chasing, kicking, and biting intruders, complemented by their unmistakable braying, which serves as an alert to farmers or fellow guardians. While donkeys are low maintenance and resistant to diseases, they may not be as effective against large or multiple predators, and training or socialization might be necessary to integrate them seamlessly with livestock. <laughs> Llamas, with their curious and alert disposition, take on the responsibility of protecting sheep, goats, alpacas, and poultry from a range of predators. These majestic creatures use their size, loud alarm calls, spitting, kicking, and chasing to deter potential threats. Their low maintenance nature, adaptability to various climates, and ability to graze alongside livestock make them valuable additions to the protective team. However, like donkeys, llamas may struggle against formidable or multiple predators and benefit from early introductions to the flock for optimal bonding. Geese, often overlooked but remarkably vigilant, serve as guardians for chickens, ducks, and other poultry, offering protection against foxes, raccoons, hawks, and owls. Their noisy honking and wing flapping create a commotion that serves as a warning signal to the flock and the farmer. Additionally, geese possess the capability to confront predators with their strong beaks, claws, and wings. Easy to care for and resistant to diseases and predators, Geese may require training or socialization to establish respect for livestock and farmers alike. These alternative guardian animals present different strengths and weaknesses. <laughs> suited for varying situations and environments. The choice of the right animal hinges on the specific needs of the farm or pasture. Proper training, care, and support are paramount to ensuring the effectiveness of these guardians in protecting livestock from dingoes and other predators. The harmonious integration of these diverse protectors showcases the adaptability and resourcefulness that lie within the realm of agricultural practices, aiming to strike a balance between the preservation of wildlife and the safeguarding of domesticated animals. Now, let's look deeper into the point of coexistence. Can farmers find a way to exist with the dingoes? Convinced that the dingoes on Fraser Island are pure dingoes. The economic benefits of coexisting with dingoes are substantial. Dingoes, by managing feral herbivores and predators, contribute to the improvement of pasture and livestock quality. This, in turn, reduces the need for supplementary feeding, fencing, and pest control measures. 
translating into cost savings for farmers. Dingo's positive impact on the ecosystem also extends to providing essential services such as carbon sequestration, water purification, and pollination, presenting additional economic benefits. Moreover, coexisting with dingoes opens up new avenues for farmers, enabling them to diversify their income streams. Opportunities in ecotourism, wildlife-friendly products, and conservation incentives become accessible. This not only enhances the economic viability of farming practices, but also aligns with the growing societal interest in sustainable and environmentally conscious agricultural approaches. From a biodiversity perspective, coexistence with dingoes plays a crucial role in preserving genetic and cultural diversity. Dingoes represent the only extant representatives of an ancient lineage of domestic dogs, diverging from wolves around 10,000 years ago. As the sole large terrestrial predator surviving in Australia since the extinction of the megafauna, dingoes hold a unique place in the biodiversity tapestry. Furthermore, they are deeply intertwined with indigenous culture and spirituality, being considered as ancestors, totems, companions, and guardians. Preserving the genetic and cultural heritage of dingoes becomes an ethical imperative. Coexisting with dingoes ensures that these unique animals, with their intrinsic value and rights as living beings, are respected and protected. By embracing coexistence, we contribute to the preservation of biodiversity at both the genetic and cultural levels. To facilitate coexistence, modern farming practices must adapt and innovate. A range of tools and strategies can be employed to reduce the risk and impact of dingo attacks while fostering tolerance and acceptance. Livestock guarding animals, maremma dogs, donkeys, llamas, and geese serve as effective protectors, deterring, chasing, or fighting off predators. They not only enhance livestock welfare and productivity, but also offer companionship and security. We've evolved to be strong and agile, a necessary. Electric fencing. Combined with other deterrents, electric fencing prevents or reduces dingo access by delivering a mild electric shock. The integration of lights, sounds, or smells enhances its effectiveness. Pay. Bad news for Simon, and potentially fatal news for Livestock husbandry. By adjusting the timing, location, and composition of grazing, livestock husbandry minimizes livestock exposure and vulnerability to dingoes. Selective breeding can also produce livestock that are more resistant or... Re there, there, there's something going... Non-lethal deterrence. Visual, auditory, olfactory, or taste stimuli such as fladry, sirens, repellents, or aversive conditioning can discourage or scare away dingoes from livestock. And fast enough to be exciting. Coexistence, education, raising awareness and understanding of dingoes and their role in the ecosystem through accurate and evidence-based information fosters positive attitudes and behaviors. Coexistence incentives, providing financial and non-financial support and recognition motivates farmers and communities to coexist with dingoes. Compensation, insurance, subsidies, grants, certification, and recognition are potential incentives. These tools and strategies, when integrated into modern farming practices, create a holistic and adaptive approach to coexisting with dingoes. While not devoid of challenges, the pursuit of coexistence proves to be a worthwhile and achievable endeavor, one that brings benefits to both the environment and society. It requires commitment, continuous adaptation, and a collective effort to reshape our relationship with dingoes transforming them from adversaries into allies in the intricate dance of ecological balance and biodiversity preservation.